This is a review of the Guild Trilogy, made up of the books Operation Red Jericho, Operation Typhoon Shaw, and Operation Storm City by Joshua Mull that came out between 2005 and 2009. So I don't think I've ever reviewed a novel on this channel before, let alone a children's novel. However, I want to show you these books as I think they are very special in terms of using visuals and design to create an extraordinarily fun and immersive experience that goes beyond your typical novel. And so I want to start with that. I'll go into the story and stuff in more detail later, but just to get you in the ballpark for now, think a young Indiana Jones adventure in 1920s China. And the premise of the books is that they're all based on the diary of one of the main characters and supported by an extensive archive of materials that relate to the adventures. So as we go through, you'll see the books have a lot of visual and textual annotations to explain and enhance what's being discussed in the main body text, and it's all presented as in-world illustrations, documents, and ephemera. Maps, photographs, technical diagrams, diagrams, newspaper clippings, pages from other books, and so on. And they are all designed with incredible attention to detail and authenticity that adds so much immersion and visual joy to the world building. Even down to other little graphic design elements like the rubber stamped ink you see on some pages. I mean, there are just so many tiny but immaculate attention to details in the presentation and design of the visuals that I would love to point out and appreciate, but the video would be an hour long. But in terms of the broader idea of what you'll see, if a building or vehicle is mentioned in the story, there'll be like a cross-section diagram of it with some history and technical information. Or say a certain object is mentioned, there might be a photograph of the artifact from the archive. The black and white illustrations throughout come from the sketchbook of one of the characters. Mostly they are very sketchy and loose, other times rendered more fully with detail, but always wonderfully appropriate and just look like they belong. These supplements aren't all visual though, there are also more traditional footnotes and sidebars that add extra information to the main text, so like when a character is introduced or a historical event or technical concept is referenced, whether real or made up, it's explained in these little sidebars. However, as fun and interesting as that sort of stuff may be, it's meaningless if the story and writing it's supporting itself isn't enjoyable. Thankfully, they too are absolutely fantastic. I came for the visuals, but stayed for the story. So, in terms of the story, in 1920, Rebecca and Doug Mackenzie's parents go missing while on an expedition in China, and the teenager's search for their parents takes them from Shanghai to the South China Seas, a little bit in India and then up around China's western deserts. All the while, they're discovering information about a secret society called the Honorable Guild of Specialists that their parents appear to have been part of, and the race for powerful ancient technologies that has caused a schism within the guild. So, I mentioned Indiana Jones, mostly because that's common shorthand for exotic adventure historical fiction, that style of quote-unquote boys adventure, 19th century Ryder Haggard, Jules Verne, and then into the 20th century with pulp adventures and serials. But in terms of the most specific comparison, if you're at all familiar with the Tintin comics, it's quite similar to those. However, unlike Tintin and Indiana Jones, these books are not standalone adventures that you can read out of order, you have to start with the first book first. As for the style it's written in, how it may appeal to children versus potential adult readership, I'd say the sweet spot for who these books seem to be written for is the 11 to 14 year old set. But I think a better way to describe it would be for 11 plus, because like all the best children's literature, it absolutely has as much appeal and enjoyment for a potential adult reader. And I say that as someone who only read these books for the first time as an adult, and as someone who is very easily put off by the style of writing typically used in kids and young adult literature. And I mean, that's who these books are aimed at, so they still use a lot of that sort of style and conventions, but in a way I found a lot more sophisticated and readable, rather than the typical deliberate attempt of writing down to appeal to an audience. Joshua Mole has done a fantastic job as writer and storyteller. It's engaging and very fast-paced, which I like. Something is always happening and it never lingers, and it's just such a fun and great realization of that sort of pulpy adventure novel. To the point that I've read these books three times now, there's a surprising degree of sophistication used in the history, culture, and science discussed, even sometimes being a little beyond me, but in a way I appreciate it and went a long way to making the story feel more believable 
and also help in keep an adult reader engaged. Likewise, if you're considering these books for a kid who is intelligent and inquisitive, um, having certain academic and worldly ideas discussed that are perhaps a touch beyond their age group should inspire and challenge them to want to learn more, which is awesome. The flip side of that, of course, is if it's a kid who's perhaps not ready for that, then there's the risk of them becoming bored and disengaged. Also, he does frequently slip in some rather uncommon words that are outside most modern readers' vocabulary, but ideally, the fact that it's such a straight-up, fun, well-realized adventure tale will still be able to carry pretty much any reader through. Plus, this is where a lot of those visuals and annotations reveal themselves to not just be fun, but actually really helpful in getting a clearer understanding of what's being discussed. Also, if the prospective reader is someone who previously or currently has really enjoyed any of the books from the Ologies series, this Guild trilogy represents a fantastic graduation to a more advanced literary level, while still retaining a lot of the same feel of those books. The blending of historical and scientific fact and fiction in these books is remarkably well done, and at times indiscernible. You know, there are things that are obviously made up for the story, the more sort of pulpy, over-the-top science fiction things, but there are also so many things mentioned that I would have to try and look up and either be delightfully surprised that it is real and it's worked into the story so well, or delightfully surprised surprised that the author made it up so plausibly that I wasn't sure if it was real or not. So when you combine things like that with the equally detailed and authentic looking documents and design throughout the books, they create such a wonderful and immersive sense of verisimilitude. The one strange area where the books forego their commitment to immersion is that the main text is written from a standard third-person narrator's perspective, which isn't a problem at all, I just think it's a little weird. Because like I said at the start, the premise is that the books are based on Rebecca's diary, and in fact there are frequent extracts taken directly as written by Becker in the diary, and then it'll switch back to a third-person narration. And so I don't quite understand why the whole story isn't presented in an epistolary fashion, which seems a far more natural and obvious approach. Especially because, like I just said, the books do that sometimes anyway, yet Starkly abandons all the momentous and painstaking effort gone into creating immersion just to have it be told in third-person, which undermines all that. Whereas had it been completely done in a diary format, that would have added to it. Especially when there are only a handful of scenes in book two that take place outside of the two protagonists' observation, though of course as an author you have the power to restructure that information in a way that would still work. Again, this is not a problem at all, but just kind of weird and obvious that this isn't the best way to narrate this story amidst everything else the books are trying to be. The other thing I think some people may critique or be unimpressed by is that, as beautiful and delightful as all these visual components are, or any additional information they may convey, the fact of the matter is they are essentially nothing more than novelty, in the sense that they are in no way integral to the story. You could completely remove all of them and just have the main body text, and you wouldn't be missing any information fundamental to the telling of the story. And so you may be disappointed that the books go to all this effort to include these visual and intriguing elements, yet are not utilizing them in any way that makes them an integral part of telling this story, which can then just make them seem like unnecessary or unrealized novelty or set dressing. Likewise, there's no puzzles or secrets that can be found in the documents, as far as I could tell anyway. Maybe there are some easter eggs or clues I just didn't pick up on. Despite all this, however, personally, I don't really mind. Yes, it would have been better had the books done more to live up to their potential on that front, but the fact that they don't, that maybe it is just novelty, isn't something that detracts from my experience and adoration of the books. Purely at face value, I think they add enormously to the world building and immersion and experience, and therefore completely justify themselves as is. Especially because without them, I never would would have picked these books up, wouldn't have given them a second glance, and so would have missed out on this fun story. But I was drawn to them and happy to take the chance based solely on the appeal of this largely unique style of augmenting the novels with these visual elements. That I then got to discover the story itself is great, that the books are style and substance, was gratifying to say the least. Because this is what it all comes down to, and why I wanted to showcase these books. Because your typical novel is a brilliant functional tool for presenting stories, but beneath the covers, all that space is taken up by what is simply bricks of black letters on paper that are completely devoid of any visual appeal. And for 99% of novels, that's fine. Any sort of visual additions like we've seen here would be at best negligible visual interest and entertainment, and at worst completely unnecessary and expensive. But there 
are some stories, some books, that can be enhanced immeasurably by being presented this way. And I think in this world of ebooks and audiobooks, it gives physical books more reason to take up space in your home. And I'm not talking like you see books that try and appear beautiful and deluxe with leather covers and gilt edges and ribbon bookmarks and stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. Yeah, it looks nice, but it's just a banal way to make the books more expensive without actually enhancing the content and experience of the book. I'm talking about what these Guild Trilogy books do to present a fun, interesting, and beautiful way to enhance the experience and telling of a story. Again, for most books, it's completely unnecessary, but I feel like there's so much unrealized potential for more books to do this kind of thing, and it's just all too rare to see anything like this, which is why I can't commend the Guild Trilogy and Joshua Mole highly enough for this rare display of vision, effort, and skill. The concept, story, writing, visuals, design, and presentation, everything is so incredibly well done that then when taken all together as one package, it's a really special set of books, particularly impressive given that these are the very first books he ever did. Sadly though, these are the only books he's done, except for one other called The Great Space Race, which I haven't read, and though it does appear to be a novel using similar immersive visual presentation, it's completely unrelated to the Guild trilogy. I am very surprised and a little bummed that these didn't become a bigger franchise or have any more books set in this world. I'll pin a comment below with a link to a Pinterest board I have where I've created a sort of visual reference list of these types of what I call immersive books. I'm obsessed with them, so if if you know of any I haven't included there, definitely let me know. But for further reading in terms of themes and genre and story, I mean, there's loads, and I already mentioned Tintin, but I think the thing that reminds me most of the Guild trilogy that I'd like to single out is definitely a free webcomic called The Adventures of the 19XX. So if you like either the Guild trilogy or the 19XX comic, there's a very good chance you'll like the other. It's well worth checking out if you're a fan of the style of early 20th century globe-trotting pulp adventures. I guess I probably have to mention the Explorer's Guild too, which is for more of an adult readership. It's not only thematically similar, but is also a different example of what I was talking about in terms of making visually engaging novels. But neither the visuals, nor the text especially, are anywhere near as good as the Guild trilogy. Kevin Costner is apparently not a very good storyteller, and I couldn't keep my eyes open reading that book and had to give up. But you may have better luck, and it's worth at least looking into at any rate. One final note, if you go looking for copies of the Guild trilogy online, be aware they were also published in paperback. I have never seen them, which means I'm not sure if they include any or all of the visuals and gatefolds particularly that you'll have seen in these hardcovers, so you may want to be cautious, although you really shouldn't be getting the paperbacks anyways, that means you miss out on these wonderful textured covers.